April. Um, uh, so our speaker tonight is uh, Craig Zondag from the Lemon Fair Insect Control District. He's a uh, uh, He's a member of Otter Creek Audubon Society. He's been a board member in the past. He's a member of our education committee. Um, he's a very entertaining speaker, and he's going to tell you all about uh, mosquito biology and uh, how uh, efforts are uh, for controlling it in this area. So everybody, please welcome Craig. Thank you. Can you hear me if the mic is right there? All right. Um, wow, what a, what a um, wonderful group of folks showing up tonight. Um, and uh, so I appreciate everyone being here. And I understand that a lot of people are intrigued by the title. And uh, <laughs> that was their impetus for coming. So I, I'm grateful that I came up with that title. Uh, it's not very innovative. <laughs> it just says what it is. But, um, but a, couple, a couple things. I did bring some props, um, some other information. And uh, in fact, uh, throughout the, the evening, um, and I'll be asking at the end of the evening, uh, how, many, how many mosquitoes are in this jar? OK, so think about that. And I'll take answers at the end of the, at the, end of the meeting. Um, but uh, these, and this is only less than half of what we trapped last year. Yeah. And there's also, there's also brochures for the Lemon Fair Insect Control District on the table over here. Um, one of the other things uh, I'd like to talk about and just kind of jog our memories a little bit. How many remember the off commercial where the scientist or research scientist in a, in a lab coat sticks his arm into a <laughs> plexiglass case and it's filled with mosquitoes? Raise your hand if you remember that. Okay. This is your special night. This is his microscope. Yeah. My best friend's wife is Laurie Hopkins, and the research scientist in that commercial is Dr. Tom Hopkins, and uh, lived in Maryland. And when, uh, when he died, Laurie and my best friend were cleaning out the house, and they came across this, and they said, Craig needs to have this. <laughs> so given the opportunity after, after the evening, I can plug it in. You can actually see mosquitoes through this microscope, just as Dr. Hopkins did. Um, you know, 70 years ago. So, uh, but that's, that's his microscope. Okay. Uh, the other item, uh, and just to answer a couple questions up front, how many of you have been seeing mosquitoes over the winter? Quite a few of you have, yeah. So at this latitude, we do have uh, uh, mosquitoes that are active year round and uh, ones that look for to be inside your house uh, to winter over, whether it's through a basement, uh, through basement vents, chimneys, uh, bathroom vents, they manage to find their way. And they're not necessarily looking for a blood meal at that time. Uh, they're just wintering over and waiting for, for spring. And uh, it's amazing how long some of these uh, mosquitoes can live as adults. And, um, and so I just, uh, at the lab this week, on Tuesday in fact, um, I had a sweep net with me and I swept about a dozen live mosquitoes flying around the entrance of the lab. And they probably came out from underneath the foundation or in the shed, the, um, the carriage shed uh, next to the lab. And uh, the, only, the only positive thing about having mosquitoes emerge, and if, they, and if these actually emerged from the wetlands already, and they, um, they're adults, and we get a deep enough freeze, it'll knock down that first wave of mosquitoes. So that's one advantage. And, uh, and of, of mosquito species, they're uh, univoltine and multivoltine mosquitoes. Univoltine mosquitoes are, are snow melt mosquitoes, typically. And it means that the females are capable of laying one batch of eggs. And then they're done. So they, they'll, they'll finish out their life for about a month. Uh, become bird food, um, other insect food for anything migrating back or um, growing out of the wetlands. And, uh, and the multivoltine ones, are they're obviously laying more than one batch of eggs. And uh, some of the multivoltine mosquitoes can lay as many as eight, 
nine, 10, 11, 12 batches of eggs in a season. And each one of those batches could be as many as 70 to 120 eggs uh, per, per egg laying scenario. So what we faced last year was a situation from the end of July through August, through September, where a lot of vernal pools in, your, in the forests next to your home never dried up. And they just they became excessive breeding pools um, for mosquitoes, and, and particularly this multivaulting mosquito species. Uh, it was the, of all the mosquitoes we trapped last year, um, this species represented 47 to 48% of all the species that we trapped. And, um, and it was uh, Oclaritatus trivitatus. Uh, ironically, well, not ironically, it's uh, a mosquito that's world renowned. It, um, it's famous enough that it's recognized for having carried its own disease um, called trivitatus. And uh, fortunately, we don't, it's not been identified in North America. Um, and, uh, but there, but there are a lot of trivitatus mosquitoes and it's the, it's the one that kept you from getting into your garden last year. And, uh, it was my number one complaint call. Uh, I can't get into my garden. The mosquitoes are so bad. I said, you're not the only one. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a tough year. It was a really tough year. So let's get going with the, with the program here. And, uh, so, uh, mosquitoes suck and, uh, Let's see, this isn't working. Why isn't this working? Oh, okay, there we go. Mosquitoes suck blood. And, uh, and it's actually the females. The females are the ones that suck blood and they require that blood for the protein for egg development. Uh, male mosquitoes are nectar feeders. And so they're actually pollinating flowers, believe it or not. Um, and, uh, but male mosquitoes do not take a blood meal at all. Uh, it's just the females. And, but the female needs that blood meal for every time she gets pregnant for, for egg development. She needs that blood protein for egg development. And, um, and so that's a uh, familiar sight. This is, I'm, just, I'm not sure why this is doing this this way. Okay. So how many, mos how many species of mosquitoes exist worldwide? Starting, starting out with a quiz here. Raise your hand if you think it's A, approximately 3,500. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, we've got nine people out there that think it's A. Uh, B, approximately 2,000. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, we're going to be split right kind of down the middle thir in thirds. Um, and approximately 1,200 to 1,500 worldwide. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, so we're about in, in thirds. It's a, a, a third vote. All right. Um, answer is, no, that didn't work. <laughs> okay. 3,500 species worldwide. Okay. It's approximate, you know. And um, the next question is how many, how many species of mosquitoes are attracted to humans? Good. Let's have A, about approximately 10 species, no hands up. B, approximately 100. C, approximately 1,000. Answer is B. So think about this for a moment. There's 3,500 species of mosquitoes out there, and only 100 of those species are considered a nuisance and a problem for humans. What are the rest of those mosquitoes doing? <laughs> so this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna begin to answer some of these questions. Uh, they are significant prey to a number of predators. As you can see, uh, there are a variety of uh, fish, uh, the mosquito fish in particular, uh, which would face extinction if uh, mosquitoes didn't exist, and many other predators depend on the mosquito fish for food. Um, so again, a lot of what I've, you know, I can't emphasize that first law of ecology enough in this presentation, and that it simply states that everything is connected to everything else. And, uh, but I wish it wasn't so much in some areas. <laughs> but, uh, 
And then, uh, and as far as insects, uh, there would be a, a dramatic decreases in populations without uh, without mosquitoes. There's so many insects that feed on mosquitoes. Uh, you know, mosquitoes begin their life cycle in water, as do a lot of other insects. And there's a lot of insects that feed on those in the water, as well as fish feeding on larvae uh, in the water. And uh, so that's a really important part. Uh, reptiles, the same with reptiles, uh, dramatic decreases in populations without mosquitoes. And birds, uh, I've read once that the number of birds would decrease by 50% without mosquitoes. And uh, so that's uh, something to bear in mind when, when we uh, malign these things. So do you like chocolate? <laughs> Most of us do, I think. Um, you know, I've heard there are people that say, you know, have come up to me and said, I eat a lot of chocolate and I think I attract a lot of mosquitoes. And, um, and then I've had other people say, I don't eat chocolate, but the mosquitoes bother me just the same. So it, there's a bit of a misnomer out there about the idea of mosquitoes and chocolate, with the exception that the males pollinate the cocoa plant. And, um, and midges and mosquitoes are really significant pollinators. And this, these are the uh, cocoa flowers, which are beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So here's a male mosquito, um, one of the fancier ones in, in the world. And uh, it is nectaring, uh, what we call nectaring. Uh, males are pretty easily identifiable because their antenna are real feathery. They're big feathery tufts out front. Females don't have that feathery tuft. So you can actually identify that mosquito in the hand. And if it's in your hand, it's not going to bite you. <laughs> it's, it's a male. <laughs> so, um, but that's uh, one, of the, one of the key features in identifying uh, male mosquitoes. Number of mo uh, mosquito species in the USA. There are approximately 176 species of mosquitoes in the USA. And that includes Alaska. However, when we include Canada and Mexico, we can add another 100 species. Yeah. Uh, number of mosquitoes in Vermont. Any guesses? <laughs> I'm hearing some guesses. There are 49 to 50 species of mosquitoes in Vermont. Unfortunately, that number might be growing. We're, we're beginning to see the migration of mosquitoes moving north. And uh, one of the ones that's of uh, particular concern is the Asian tiger mosquito. Uh, which is now been, has been documented and identified at the southern border of Vermont. And um, it's pretty well established in Massachusetts. Um, but uh, uh, Aedes albopictus is its scientific name. And it has um, a lot of black and white stripes on it. Thus, tiger gets uh, placed in the name of that mosquito. And it's a, a potential vector for about 8 or 11 different diseases. Um, and so that's another, another thing. The other thing about that particular mosquito species is its primary breeding habitat are artificial containers. So clogged gutters, um, flower pot saucers, you know, the, base, the basins underneath your flower pots, barrier breeding mosquitoes, could be, it could be Asian tiger. Um, and uh, tarps covering firewood that, that hold rainwater that don't get tipped and dry out in time. It takes about five days from an egg to become an adult. Um, and uh, so depending on the, what the environmental conditions are. So, um, so tip and drain when it rains. And that's not the first time you're going to hear me say that in this presentation. Um, the, uh, uh, the other one that's a container breeder in this area it, and also a potential vector is the northern house mosquito. And that's Culex pipiens. And, uh, and it's famously found in tire bunkers and piles, which I'll, I'll also be showing you. Um, so again, once you eliminate that species from your, or that habitat from your um, yards, you eliminate the risk of having those mosquitoes on your property. So here's a, a diagram of the four stages of development of, uh, of a mosquito. The top left one, of course, is a raft of eggs. Not all mosquitoes lay their eggs as rafts. Sometimes they just lay them singly. And uh, the single eggs just um, drift to the bottom of uh, whatever water pool they're in. 
and, um, and then eventually they hatch. When they hatch, the early form looks like this. This is the larval stage. And, uh, and this, of course, is the head on this end. And they, um, uh, they go through four stages of development uh, where this is really, really small. And it, as it grows, it sheds that skin, gets a little bit larger. And it goes through actually four instar stages of development before it actually becomes this stage, which is the pupa. The pupa is equivalent to um, a cocoon. Um, a caterpillar to a cocoon or uh, and to a, a butterfly. So it's no longer feeding in this stage, it's in that transformational stage of becoming a swimming insect to becoming a flying insect. And, uh, and so those are the four um, basic stages of, uh, of a mosquito. So here this diagram <coughs> exhibits male and female, male hairy antenna, mate, female gets a blood meal, female lays eggs, egg raft, Eggs begin to hatch. Uh, what you're seeing here is a position, uh, this would be the, the water surface area here, where they, um, they have a breathing tube at the tip of their abdomen, and, um, and they're, so they're breathing on the surface of the water. And then, uh, and then to the end, to the uh, pupa, and then from the pupa, they emerge as an adult, and the cycle continues. They do need to be in water, yeah. So one of, one of the things that I often face when I'm in the field is I might identify fresh larvae in the floodplain and go back the next day. And fortunately, you know, enough of the floodplain drains down that that larva now is stuck in the, in, the, in the grass, the high ground, and so they won't survive. Yes? Right, it's four to five days, yeah. Although there are some larvae that actually have to winter over, um, so they have to be in water 365 days, and uh, and I'll show you that. I'll show you one of those here in a little bit. These are some of the transmittable diseases, and some of them have been, been making headlines in North America. Uh, one of the one, ones that's most uh, recent is yellow fever. has been recognized down south in the southern states. And, uh, and of course, malaria is still out there. Uh, West Nile virus is the one that's perhaps most common around here, and everyone probably remembers the Eastern equine encephalitis outbreak uh, in Cornwall area, Whiting, uh, a few years ago, where we actually had a couple human deaths um, from that. But uh, those, are, those are some of the more common diseases that we're keeping an, our, our eye out for. Uh, as far as the Lemon Fair Insect Control District, we don't do anything with vector analysis. That's handled at the state level. And uh, they collect blood-fed mosquitoes um, in pools of 50 and uh, isolate them and then send them to the Department of Health where they're tested for, for disease. So that's all handled through the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Farms and Markets, and uh, the Vermont Department of Health. So mosquitoes and West Nile virus, this will be also true for, uh, for e Eastern equine encephalitis, how this actually works. Um, I'll just first off by, start by saying that when e there may be a Culex uh, mosquito or uh, the other species that would be responsible for, um, primarily responsible for triple E, that gets a blood meal from you early in the season. It's not likely that the viremia or the virus is concentrated enough in the mosquito at that point to give you an infection right off. So again, these are gonna be multivoltine mosquitoes. So the more blood sucking scenarios that female gets, and particularly when she gets it from an infected bird, because the birds are gonna be the ones that are actually holding, carrying the virus, and um, the viremia begins to concentrate. So now you're the fifth or sixth blood meal in the season, that's when you're subject to getting disease. Okay, it may not be in that first, second, third blood meal, but after the viremia begins to concentrate within the mosquito and you become part of that food chain, um, that's what you need to pay attention to. I always tell folks, you know, we're always glad for October to come around, you know, and you know, we're finishing up our gardening outside and uh, it's like, oh, it's just one mosquito. No, that's the mosquito you need to watch out for. That's the one you, so pay attention to those single mosquitoes late in the season, um, because those are the ones that, are, that have, potentially have the greatest danger of, of infection. So, 
yeah, we're done with the nuisance mosquitoes for the season, but the, the vector mosquitoes are, are out there. So, so that's how that works. Um, so the mosquito gets a blood meal from uh, a reservoir as a, a bird for a host, and there's a number of birds uh, in the canopy of forests that actually hold the virus but doesn't affect them physically, and um, they're capable of living just fine with holding that virus. And then, um, and then the mosquito uh, is the bridge vector getting a, a blood meal from the horse or a human, and that's the dead end uh, incidental host. Uh, which would, would bring about the disease. Okay, but how quickly do they transmit the, the virus into you? I mean, is just as soon as it, in, the, in the moment that you're getting the blood, blood, the blood meal, or they're, they're, the female's getting the blood meal from you, yeah, it's, it's coming into you. How soon symptoms show up in the person is questionable. I think that just depends a lot on your own immune system. And... Um, so, but, uh, but, you know, pay attention to, you know, how the welt looks. If it doesn't look like a traditional welt, you know, there's something else going on on the, on the surface of your skin. So, you know, definitely check, get checked out if you have any suspicion. Hey, when the mosquito bites you, how soon does the venom go from the mosquito to you? If you squish the mosquito, you see it. Right, right. It's possible that it... It could be in you already after you've hit it, and you know, and it, you know, and there's a blood mark on your skin from the body of the, of the mosquito. Um, so I always say, given the opportunity, you know, I know in my car I keep those uh, uh, the hand sanitizer, alcohol sanitizers, and if I get bit in the field, I you know, I really rub the sanitizer into that area. To, you know, especially if it's opened up. You know, the, the mechanism in the, of mosquitoes, first of all, when they, they take the, this um, serrated tongue through their proboscis, um, and they ha it's coated with saliva that numbs the surface of the skin. That's why you oftentimes don't feel the mosquito penetrating, because they're already, they're anesthetizing you. They know, they know that if they, they're leaving a mark and, the, and the, their victim feels it, they're going to get squat. They're, they're gonna get squashed, right? So, um, so they actually have that, and then they successfully get the blood meal without much duress. And, uh, and it's actually when they're pulling that serrated tongue out, that's when you feel the bite. Because the serrations are coming this back out. Against against the against the skin, so that's when you that's typically when you feel it. Yes. Um, I don't know that it does. It makes me feel better. <laughs> I mean, I'm not I've not had an issue, and I'm in the field all the time, and and. Uh, Yeah, if it helps neutralize, it may help neutralize some of uh, any virus that might be going into the, into the skin, at, uh, particularly at the surface area. So, who can name this bird? Warbler? Northern water thrush, yeah. So, northern water thrush. I actually photographed this at the end of the boardwalk at uh, Otterview Park. And... Um, and again, um, there's a number of birds I'm going to be showing you that have beaks that are adapted for uh, feeding on insects. And this is one definitely that, that, does, that does feed on insects. Um, and th though this beak doesn't look so much as an insectivorous bird, I've seen this uh, bird species. Can someone name this one for me? It's not a song. It does have the stick pin in the breast, but it's not a song sparrow. Savannah, yes. The savannah has the yellow eyebrow over the eye, and that's a savannah sparrow, and I photographed that out in Bridport. Um, and I have seen um, uh, savannah sparrows feeding on insects in the, in the grasses and the fields out there. Never been able to identify what, what insects they're actually feeding on. And then, of course, when uh, migration is happening right now, um, these are some uh, lesser yellow legs that I photographed down on the Lemon Fair River floodplain. And they were feeding on mosquito larvae. 
Um, I walked right to the spot where they were at, and there was larvae there, and I'd, I'd seen them probing down into the, into the water. Um, so again, the mosquitoes provide nutrition and sustenance for a lot of these birds as they're migrating further north. And these, this was early enough that these might have been still heading all the way up into Canada, uh, into the Canadian Shield someplace. Who recognizes that flower? Nope. It's fallen off of the stem, and it's in a cup of water, and in the water are some swimming mosquito larvae. Does anybody know what that flower is, though? It's a tree flower, yep. Yeah. Red maple, yeah. That's a red maple flower. So about the time that the red maple flowers start coming off is a phenological note for me to get out in the field and start looking for those snowmelt mosquito larvae and, and doing my surveillance. Uh, although with as mild as it was this winter, I'll be, I'll, I'm not going to wait for the, leaves, for the flowers to come into bloom and fall off the trees. But this has been a typical um, experience, uh, and it's, I think it's always very interesting to note phenological activities. Uh, phenological being those annual activities that you put on the calendar, and you see how close on the calendar it shows up. Uh, like the swallows of Capistrano always showing up on the same date each year when they, when they return. Uh, yes? I'm not going to wait for the flowers to come off. For what, why? Because what happens? The, 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 the larvae are on the flowers? No, no, no. It just happened to be in my dipper cup. So I use. Whoops. I've got. Uh, oh, okay. So oh, I, I, see. They come out I the use table. this, okay? And I dip into the water. And, and it just so happened that there was a maple flower in there. And when I put it in my collection cup, I dumped the, the, the flower and the, and the larva in there at the same time. And then, of course, in the spring, we get a return of great numbers of tree swallows. And uh, um, if you've ever experienced the tree swallows on the Lemon Fair Valley, it's really quite a spectacular sight. I've seen as many as 5,000 in a day um, moving, yeah, moving uh, up through the valley. And, um, and they're, they're, flying, they're flying low right over, the, right over the area where the mosquitoes are emerging. Um, there's actually, uh, of the tree swallows, there's actually one barn swallow in this photo as well. But I think there was there one, two, three, four, five, six, I think there's at least seven, seven birds in this photo. Um, and, uh, but it really is. Um, so keep an eye out for, uh, for, for tree swallows and barn swallows and thank them on their migration as they eat some of our mosquitoes en route. They're, no, they're catching them in the air. Yeah, they're actually feeding on emerged um, mosquitoes. Yeah. And of course, the uh, common yellowthroat. Um, I think I photographed this down at Otterview Park, too. And the Baltimore Oriole has a beak very designed for, for eating insects. And, um, and then um, this is a challenging one. But someone knows what someone knows what this is. No, that's what. Yeah, it's an easy guess. It would be nuthatch, but it's not a nuthatch. This is a canopy canopy dwelling bird. Nests in the canopy. It's the red-eyed vireo. Yeah, it's a vireo. It's the red-eyed vireo. You can see a little bit of the black eye stripe there on on the bird. And then, of course, the rose-breasted grosbeak, um, which is, again, more of a seed eater than it is insectivorous. Uh, but uh, I couldn't resist in not putting this uh, into, the, into, the, into the program. It's one of my favorite birds. And I remember when I was a child seeing my very first rose-breasted grosbeak and just being aghast. It was just amazing. Um, but, you know, the thing that where birds are most vulnerable in getting bitten by a mosquito, of course, is this stage. They have no feather protection at all. And, um, and so when their skin is exposed like that, that's when they're getting, you know, some mosquitoes are getting their first blood meals of those early, early spring mosquitoes. 
Yes, please. So, For the mosquito, yes, uh, that's a really good question. That's a really good question, and um, and I I have a I have I personally have my own my doubts and questions about how effective bats are in taking down mosquito populations. Um, if you think about when you see bats flying in the evening, where are they? They're high. Mosquitoes are down on the ground looking for mammalian meals, so. So it's a little bit of a misnomer. Mosquitoes, at a certain point when they're mating, they'll fly a little bit higher. But every night, you're not having that many mosquitoes flying at you know, rooftop height that where you typically see, see bats. So by far and large, I think bats have been overrated for being mosquito eaters. Um, and when I moved here in 2006, uh, 2007, I was fly fishing below the falls here in Middlebury. And it's when the big bat colony existed underneath the uh, the footbridge, and um, and I there were goodness a minimum of 500 bats flying around um, to the point when I was fly casting, I actually knocked two bats in the water, and I gave up, and because I didn't want to hook one with my fly, and um, and but it was it was just impossible impossible to fish, and I was getting mosquito bites when I was when I was down there even with all, all those and they were just all over the falls, right at the foot of the falls there and flying around me and so so I I question you know how effective I bats definitely serve a purpose they you know they're they're important to have and they are predators of insects but as to how many mosquitoes bats actually eat I am I'm not sure okay oh so yeah, so that <laughs> I jumped a slide here, but um, yeah. So of mosquito control, um, it's been considered uh, integrated pest management, but more recently in the industry, they're referring more specifically to mosquitoes as integrated mosquito management. And there's a lot of different means of being able to do that. And, um, and one of those means was believed that citrone citronella candles actually worked in keeping mosquitoes off your deck. Um, According to this cartoon, they don't. <laughs> so, um, and it may happen that citronella candles might, you know, a little bit, but you know, if the wind's blowing in another direction away from where you're sitting and you're getting bitten by mosquitoes, it's not really doing, doing the job that you're hoping the candles to do. This is a, an image of mosquito larvae where they are sticking that breathing tube up into the surface of the water and they're, and they're breathing. Right in the center of this is a, a pupa. Uh, so that one's in the cocoon stage. But these would be all fourth instar uh, larva. And, uh, but the one thing I want to really point out here, and just for you to remember, is that this is the breathing tube for most mosquito species. And I'm going to be sharing with you another species that has a different breathing apparatus. So one of the things that we, we do with the district, uh, the Lemon Fair Insect Control District, we're responsible for submitting uh, mosquitoes to Cornell University, uh, to the, um, the Center for Vector Disease Control. And uh, so we collect egg rafts of mosquitoes in tire piles. And we're really looking for the Culex pipiens, or the northern house mosquito, which is the primary vector for West Nile virus. And, uh, and this is the way we go about doing that. And, um, and there, as you know, there's a lot of, lot of tire piles um, in our area that are breeding a lot of mosquitoes. So in, these are uh, some actual egg rafts. Uh, there's probably uh, 120, 140 eggs in that raft, um, maybe closer to 80, 70 in this one. Um, and, uh, but that's what the, the egg rafts look like. And you, you can identify these in a, in a flower basin, you know, the, the basin underneath your flower pot. You can recognize that and just remove it. So uh, integrated pest management at work here at reducing tire piles. Uh, the Vermont Agency of Agriculture and Farms and Markets has recently obtained a sidewall cutter uh, tire slicer. And, uh, and it looks like this. 
Uh, it has, uh, on the very back, is a means of being able to slice tire, si slice the sidewall of the tire off. And on this side is a tread cutter. So you can, you know, because otherwise you're just left with a donut of a tread. And so it makes it easier to dispose the tread by cutting it into sections. And even the treads themselves have been used for shingling sheds and, and barns. Um, once you shingle a roof with tires, you're done. You don't ever have to change that. So it's, I think it's a great, you know, great use of recycling. And um, and so, so the state has finally obtained one of these. The, it was brought to our attention that this uh, machine existed, gosh, seven years ago, I think. Uh, or we took a field trip down to Cambridge, New York, uh, to see one in action. And this is uh, two of my interns from last summer. Uh, we took a field trip over to the uh, Vermont Agency of Agriculture for a trial run uh, to see how this thing works. And, um, and that's Audrey Maxwell, who was a Middlebury College student last year, and she's in France this semester. And Ramsey Anise, who uh, is a UVM student. Uh, and this is the end product. So the sidewalls are heavy enough still to hold down the tarps on horizontal bunkers, but they no longer collect water. No more mosquito habitat. This is our goal. You know, we want to we want to see this really take off. And I'm hoping that uh, on July 20th, when we have our LFICD open house, we'll have the tire slicer there, the sidewall cutter there, for demonstration purposes, and farmers will be able to get a closer look at it and see it in operation as well. So. Another, another reason for tire reduction. Um, uh, there was one of our board members uh, who was doing field work with me in Bridport, and we saw this black plume of smoke uh, on the, from the Lemon Fair River. And, um, and we just started driving toward this plume of smoke and discovered this was over in Bridport, um, out in the field. And uh, it was quite disturbing to see uh, a tire pile like this on fire. And we, I have no idea. I never saw anything in the paper as to whether it was set intentionally um, or what. I never found a, any information about it. How many of you have been to Longwood Gardens? A few, few of you folks. This is Longwood Gardens down in Pennsylvania. And, um, and this is a, a really good use. Uh, if you have a, a, a water garden similar to this where you really enjoy water lilies and that sort of thing, um, you very well may be breeding mosquitoes in, in, uh, in those environments. Um, and so, but one of the things that, um, that Longwood does, and you can see that you know, some of the vegetation gets fairly thick uh, under, under the water, um, they've introduced the mosquito fish, uh, Gambusia affinis, and uh, they are voracious feeders of mosquito larvae. And they can get into the tangles of algae mats and into shallow areas. And they are very effective in uh, keeping mosquito populations down, especially in areas like Longwood Gardens, where you've got a lot of people and, uh, and wanting to be leisure and not swatting mosquitoes while they're walking around the grounds. Um, the uh, Gambusia finis has been used and actually introduced into waterways. Um, as a natural predator to mosquitoes. Vermont does not allow uh, this species to come into the state currently. Uh, it's, well, it's not been identified as ever having been native to the state. And so I think the question is, you know, bringing in a, in a new species of a fish for this purpose. Where it is introduced is in at latitudes where the fish naturally exists down south. And so it's... Um, it's in those areas. Another, oh, there's the, uh, that's the actual minute. It's, it's only an inch long, uh, the, the Gambusia affinis. So we're looking, I'm looking, I photographed this through the surface of the water. It's not a very good photograph, but that's the tail and, and that's the head. So. But another voracious feeder of mosquito larva, does anybody know what that is? That's a dragonfly naiad. A lot of people will refer them, to them as nymphs, but this is the underwater stage of a dragonfly, and this happens to be a damselfly, and um, has a long, slender body. Um, again, voracious feeders of mosquito larvae, and uh, they're, they're very effective, they're very fast. Some 
uh, mosquito ni or uh, dragonfly naiads require being in that stage for up to three years before they emerge as an adult. So they're doing a tremendous amount of work in helping keeping mosquito populations down, where, especially where you find nice concentrations of, uh, of uh, dragonflies. And then, of course, habitat. Um, uh, you know, we as ecologists and nature enthusiasts, we often identify the quality of habitat by the diversity of plant species. And this is, a, this is one that has a tremendous amount of diversity. But it's not, it's not safe from mosquitoes. And, uh, and one of those mosquitoes is this species, Cochlatidia perturbans. Um, it looks like the, fo the, it, the image is really out of focus. It's really kind of that fuzzy looking. <laughs> yeah, the scales are very, very rough on the surface of this, of this insect. And um, one of the things that en enables us to identify this in the hand is it has that light band in the middle of the proboscis, uh, those light, light scales. And uh, so that's one of the things that helps us to identify. The other thing that's interesting about this one is it seems to be more susceptible to parasites. So it looks like little drops of blood on there, but those are actually parasites on, uh, on the mosquito itself. And I don't know how, I've not discovered or, or found out how detrimental they are to the mosquito. Um, when I've trapped them in my light traps, I've kept them in the lab and um, uh, fed, the, fed the adult mosquitoes with uh, nectar. And it, they, it doesn't seem like the parasites are affected uh, or affect the mosquito detrimentally. So there's, there's some kind of a, I don't know, survival instinct there. Um, is this a male or female mosquito? Male. male. Yeah, good. All right. Mosquito differences. Uh, what we're looking at on the left here is um, uh, the exuvia or the shed skin of, uh, of a larva. And on the right, we're looking at the breathing apparatus to this particular mosquito. Again, this is the cattail mosquito. And interestingly, instead of having a breathing tube, it has a tooth with a hole in it. It pierces the stem of hollow plants in the littoral zone of, of uh, wetlands, and it snorkels. It never swims to the surface. The slightest disturbance in the water, this mosquito larva dislodges itself from the stem of the plant and buries itself in the mud. To this day, I have never found the larva of one of these guys. Yeah, they're really hard. And uh, through the Northeast Mosquito Control Association and one of the conferences, uh, one of the uh, Boston Mosquito Control Area um, districts actually took um, the big galvanized wash basins. You know, they're about this big and they're about that tall. And they would, f they would just go out and dredge mud and fill them up with mud. And then they would just start sifting sifting and looking for the, looking for the for the larva and that was the only way they could find the larva so we have really no means of being able to identify um, when these mosquitoes are going to show up uh, other than phenologically they do show up kind of phenolo phenologically in the calendar um, but uh, but yeah it's a another well adapted another well adapted species and this is the more traditional uh, breathing tube apparatus of the, on the left hand side of, uh, of a mosquito, and this is them side by side. So, so two sets of graphs here. I'm going to stand in front of this one. So, this was in 2017. It was a pretty wet year. And uh, in wet years, um, floodplain mosquitoes come off um, pretty well. And this is the 80s Vexans. And so, of our light traps, we collected about 20, 25% um, 80s Vexans. Ironically, Cochlatidia perturbans didn't show up too much. There was less than 10% uh, for the whole trap season. And then uh, Culex pipians, the one that's a container breeder that comes out of tires, that was up nearly 20%. Okay? In 2018, we had a drought year. So it makes sense that Aedes vexans really dropped off because the floodplain wasn't flooded. And, um, and one thing I'll say about that is that it doesn't mean that the mosquitoes weren't there. When 80s vexans lay their eggs, their eggs can lay dormant and viable for up to three years before they hatch. So it's like a poison parsnip seed bank out there. We just never know when the perfect storm's gonna hit. Okay. Cochlotidia perturbans. 
almost 50% of all the mosquitoes we trapped that season were perturbans. That summer, I was walking across cattail wetlands that were just parched dry, cracked open. There was no water, no moisture. I have no idea where these came from. I have absolutely no idea where they came from. And then, of course, um, Culex pipians, restaurants, the container breeders, you know, they were down because containers were dry that year. Yeah. Here's an interesting plant. What is this called? Pitcher, Pitcher plant, yeah. This, <laughs> we're talking about diversity of mosquito species. We're going to talk about, talk about this one. This is called Wyoming smithii. Now, this mosquito defies just about everything um, about what the purpose of a pitcher plant is and does. This mosquito lays its eggs inside the pitcher plant. The pitcher plant, all the while, is still exuding the enzymes to break down the insects that it's feeding on. But this mosquito species is totally immune to it, not bothered by those enzymes whatsoever. And uh, in fact, when, um, when the larvae hatch, and this is, these are larvae actually inside the pitcher plant uh, swimming around, they actually end up feeding on parts of the digested insects that the plant is taking advantage of. The other amazing thing about this particular mosquito species, it stays within 90 feet of the plant it was born in. You're not likely to see this mosquito unless you're paddling through in a canoe, you know, in an area where there's, where there's pitcher plants. Uh, it's about the only time you're ever going to see that mosquito. And they are found up in the Northeast Kingdom. So, but uh, again, an amazing adaptation. Um, and uh, no, they typically don't. No, they're not. They're not even a, a, They're not listed as a, a human nuisance or um, vector nuisance. All right. Uh, this was uh, 2005, Hurricane Cindy down south. I think this was someplace in Georgia. Um, huge mosquito outbreak down there, and uh, the particular mosquito that. Um, came out of that situation is one that we have here in Vermont, but not a lot of, which I'm really grateful. Um, but it's the largest mosquito that we have in Vermont, and it, I believe it's the largest mosquito in the United States. And that's uh, Serophora uh, ciliata, and its common name is called Galley Nipper. <laughs> Galley Nipper. And, um, and they came out in such swarms um, that it was impossible literally impossible to get out of your house to your car and from your car to your house. It was, um, it was, it, there was just uh, such dangerous proportions of this mosquito. I once uh, Googled galley nipper online and I got testimonies of people who have been bit by them. And uh, there was a woman in Chicago who describes the bite of a galley nipper. She said it felt like someone stuck a marine bayonet in her arm and twisted it. Yeah. This is a version, and this mosquito doesn't fly like the typical mosquito. When this mosquito is flying around you, it flies like a deer fly. It's really, really fast, and it's on you. And it doesn't matter how many layers of clothing you have, it's going gonna, it's gonna to find your skin. So this is, a, this is one of the signs down there <laughs> for, for galley nippers are present. They said that the uh, galley nippers coming off the surface of the water looked like this. And... Um, but these aren't actually mosquitoes. These are water striders. And, um, and water striders are actually predators of mosquito larvae. So when mosquito larvae come to the surface to breathe, they're actually feeding on mosquito larvae. Um, so there are, water striders are really, really good, good for us, and we benefit largely from them. This is a galley nipper. And uh, the penny, of course, in there for scale. And I have one over on the microscope for you to look at afterwards, if you wish, uh, compared to with some other, some of the more local, smaller mosquitoes. Um, but yeah, it's it's quite quite the animal. And I was hoping. Oh, and this is what they look like in swarm. Um, these are this is actual photograph of galley nippers in swarm. And I was hoping this person was going to be here tonight. She's still around. <laughs> This is, um, Deb Laramie uh, photographed this. And, um, and this is her arm. <laughs> 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 
And she was, she actually drove to the lab after she photographed it. And I, I, I'm looking, I said, Deb, the proboscis is sticking through the twill of your shirt. She goes, yeah, I killed it before it bit me. <laughs> I said, you can be grateful you did that. <laughs> so, but um, again, we don't have a lot of them, which is a good thing. Um, and the ones that we do have, interestingly, as larvae, they are carnivorous. I once brought a, uh, a sample of about 300 plus mosquito larvae into the lab. I put them in a rearing chamber. I didn't bring a rearing chamber with me tonight. And, um, and it was on a Thursday. And I didn't get to look at any of the, uh, the larvae under the microscope on Thursday nor on Friday. So I sprinkled in some you know, fish pellets to feed them over the weekend. Came in on Monday. There were 14 larvae swimming around and one really large one. <laughs> that one galley nipper ate nearly 300 mosquito larvae over the weekend. So they're doing us a service out there in the environment. We just don't want a lot of them. <laughs> so, yes? The galley nippers don't really, they're not known for carrying uh, a disease. Yeah, yeah. But they hurt, yeah. They pack a wallop and they fly. Like I said, if you think it's just a deer fly, yeah, take a second look. Is it like a wasp stinging you? Or a I didn't, have not allowed one to sting me yet. <laughs> Again, you can, you can Google them and, you know, and get testimonies on people, you know, from people who have. And uh, if you can get through some of the explic explicatives <laughs> online. But, uh, here's an interesting one. Um, it's a close-up, of course. And uh, Uranotania sapphirina has these sapphire scales, um, uh, iridescent blue scales, and a uh, really attractive uh, mosquito. Once at one of my open houses, I was showing a woman uh, this mosquito under the microscope, and I'm going to use her quote, I'd wear that as jewelry. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> so, and I have, a, I have a dish over there with just that species of mosquitoes that you can also look at under the microscope. And um, uh, they really are beautiful to look at. And the scales on the, on the surface of the mosquito are no different than, than the scales on feathers of birds. It's, there's not an actual pigment. It's called a structural pigment. So it's just the way the light is reflected and refracted off the angles of the scale that produce that color. So same as, same as birds. And the primary uh, or the, the preferred meal for the uh, sephirina are uh, reptiles, amphibians. And uh, this is, if you look a little closer, you can see there's a mosquito in the chin of this bullfrog. And snakes. Um, people often ask, well, how does, how does a snake get bit by a, a mosquito? So the, the place between the plates on the skin are the growing, the growing plates. That's the soft area of the, of the snake. And so they're able to penetrate through that soft area between the plates of the, of, uh, the scales on a, on a snake. And then, of course, turtles are, uh, are subject to um, getting bitten also. Oh, uh, I'm sure the turtles probably do. Yeah, yeah, in in the water, given the opportunity. Yeah, thanks. That was that uh, down on the Lemon Fair River. Yeah, it's fun. And again, here's a another male uh, feeding on a flower, another male feeding on a another type of flower, and um, but really, this is my favorite animal. <laughs> and dragonflies are and have been uh, ever since I was a child, especially after I learned at age 10 that they don't bite. And, um, and, and then I just have always gravitated to them and they land on me. Uh, and I always thought that was interesting. And I remember, um, <laughs> I remember sharing this with a, a child at a, um, across the street from where I grew up in the Poconos and there was a swimming pool. and. Uh, the one little girl, uh, her name was Leslie, and you know, soaking wet, she was probably 25 pounds. She was just this little wispy thing, and and we would go out and we would, you know, look for dragonflies and catch dragonflies. And she got to the point where she was, you know, putting them on her finger, and so she um, 
she had this dragonfly on her finger around the pool, and she's like running, you know, scampering with her little bare feet around the pool. And she goes, Craig, 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 I've got a dragonfly, I've got a dragonfly. And this woman, this big woman got up from their, her lounge chair, and she's ready to like slap it. And this little girl goes, no! <laughs> It was great. She just protected us. And I'm, I'm there and I'm like, it's okay, ma'am. It's okay. <laughs> but it was a great educational opportunity um, to share about dragonflies even at that young age. And, um, but I'll always, I'll always remember that. So this one has a, a particularly interesting story. Um, once when I was doing surveillance out in the floodplain of Bridport, I had um, missed a hatch. Of, uh, of, of mosquitoes. They were still in the larval stage, but they were in the fourth stage, uh, which they begin to slow down feeding and are getting ready to pupate. And it was an area, a black mass of cloud in the water that was as nearly as wide as the front of the, the stage here and uh, about six or seven feet deep. And, um, and I thought, well, I could try to treat them but again, I'd be probably wasting product because they're no longer feeding. They're getting ready to pupate. And uh, so I went back the next day to look at the, for the pupa. I didn't find a single pupa. I couldn't figure that out. But I'm walking through the reed canary grass, and the reed canary grass is lifting up with hundreds and hundreds of meadowhawk dragonflies with their wings still in tenoral, meaning their wings are still drying. So overnight, all those dragonfly naiads just cleaned up all of those mosquito larvae and bulked up to break out of that exoskeleton and emerged as adult dragonflies. So the other common name for a dragonfly is also called a mosquito hawk. Uh, some people know that. This is another one that's common to our area. This is called a blue dasher. Another interesting one. Really creative name on this one dot-tailed white face. <laughs> and this one I photographed up at the Robert Frost Trail. This is the four-spotted skimmer. And um, so can really be grateful for, for dragonflies being in our, in our presence. And in conclusion, I'm going to leave you with a quote from Rachel Carson uh, as part of a sense of wonder. If a child is to keep alive his inborn sense of wonder, without any such gift of fairies, he needs the companionship of at least one adult who can share it, rediscovering with him the joy, excitement, and mystery the world we live in. So thank you, and I'll take questions. Yes. Oh, yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed that. Um, one of the early methods that was used to control mosquitoes way back when, when they first discovered Calderon, was, was to spray a, a very, very thin coat of oil in the water so they couldn't stick the breathing tubes up. Is that still done? No, no, that practice is no longer being used. Yeah, yeah. I wonder whether that would hurt other, other insects. Yes, it absolutely did. Yeah, it affected a lot of other things. Uh, Mm -hmm. go around and spray each one of the cases catch base. Yeah. And then in the marshlands they cut straight canals so they would get drainage. So I don't know if, if everyone could hear Gary, but you know, one of the one of the key things in knocking down mosquitoes on the planet was the invention of DDT and the application of DDT. And um, you know, when we look at uh, human history uh, in 1804, it was estimated that the global pop human population in 1804 reached a billion people. And it wasn't until 1927 that that population doubled. So in 1927, we were at 2 billion people. And then in 1960, we were at 3 billion people. 33 years later, we're at 3 billion people. And the reason why was the invention of DDT in that period of time between 1927 and 1960. And so mosquitoes have been, they've helped keep the human carrying capacity on this planet at bay. And, uh, but since we, you know, 
we've done our job to knock them down and keep people alive. There's that many more. And as of, as of New Year's Day this year, we are sitting at 8 billion people, 8 billion plus people on the planet. Yeah. yeah. On your treatment of the mosquito population to try and keep it down, what, how do you distinguish between the good ones and the others? Okay, that's a good question. How do you distinguish between the you know the good mosquitoes and the bad mosquitoes uh, when we're when we're treating? We we really don't. Um, but predominantly, I mean, we're not. You know, some of the mosquitoes I showed you in the presentation, uh, like that are in um, in the pitcher plants, for instance, we're not treating anything that where there's pitcher plants locally, uh, and we're treating floodplain mosquitoes primarily, uh, which is basically three or four, maybe six species. Uh, one of those, actually, I mentioned the uh, 80s Vexans that has, can lay its eggs and they can lay dormant for up to three years. There's another floodplain species out there, um, Claritotostictacus. Its eggs can sit there winter, summer, winter, summer for seven years before it hatches. Yeah. I mean, they're just really well adapted animals. They're, yeah, really something. Yes? Good question. How do we treat the mosquitoes? Um, we use a product. And, and it's the only thing that we do use in the Lemon Ferencic Control District. It's a BTI, it's a bacterium uh, that's naturally found in soil. The product we use is actually impregnated onto crushed corn husks, so it's granules. And it's either distributed by helicopter or by hand, or I have a backpack sprayer that I can also use. You can purchase this product in the form of dunks. And you can get this at Agway and any of the other um, ag type stores. And uh, one of these dunks will treat an area for up to 30 days. So if you have a puddle in your, in your yard that just doesn't dry down and you're beginning to notice mosquito larvae now that you know what they look like, um, you know, stick one of these things in that puddle. Stake it down like with a green bamboo tomato stake in the deepest part so that you know, there's a hole conveniently in the middle of the, of the dunk. And so that way it's always in contact with the water and doesn't drift into the, in, where it might be drying down. And, um, and then if the puddle dries down and the dunk is still there, the next time it gets wet, it gets reactivated. But this is, con this is 30 days of continue, continual um, work on knocking down mosquito larvae before they become adults. If you have a culvert in your driveway, it's a famous place for mosquitoes to lay eggs because oftentimes those culverts are just set at such an angle they don't necessarily drain well. And so you could be breeding mosquitoes there. Again, just look at where artificial containers are on your, on your property. You know, tip and drain uh, when it rains. And, um, and then, of course, enforce. If you have force around your property, and you've got those cradle knolls where a tree is tipped over with its roots and it's left a depression, and now you've got this vernal pool type situation. This is a great place to treat those areas. And, those, and that was one of the primary areas where uh, the trivitatus mosquito was coming out of last year. Okay. They, yeah, these are safe to use, yeah. Okay, so it's not killing everything. Oh, no, no, no. In fact, the BTI, um, it's uh, Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, and it targets black flies and mosquito larvae. Mm -hmm. So all the other aquatic invertebrates remain intact. And when we do a post-treatment survey, that's one of the things we're looking for. We're making sure that the more sensitive ones, like mayflies, for instance, are really good indicators of, uh, of health of, um, of water environments. Uh, I would, you know, walk your property on a regular basis and, and just start looking. I mean, you can see the larva with the naked eye, you know, and, um, and just start, start looking. And if you collect something and you have a question of what it is, bring it to me over at the lab in Weybridge. Our, we're situated right behind the Weybridge Congregational Church in what used to be the pastor's office in the carriage shed, the old antique carriage shed. So I'm, I'm located there. So just stop by with whatever you find. Oh, to attract them? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> that like That's up to you. <laughs> Let me know how that works out. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I would probably do it on your neighbor's property. <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> Oh, good question. Yeah, I, I actually, I still use off. Yeah, yeah, off and cutter, cutter spray. And back in the very corner, uh, you had a question. Um, at the back, 
Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, these are called dunks. dunks. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll leave them over here for you to look at afterwards. <coughs> yes? Uh, how long has, has uh, Windows Screen been around? And how is life worth living before that? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> There's a good question. Yeah, especially down south. Uh, no, I, I uh, have these, these 18th century foundations in our farm here and there. Mm -hmm. Mm. And it, it seems impossible. Yeah. Unless it was a different environment then. It could have been. It could have been. Yeah. I mean, you know, up until last year, the most mosquitoes I trapped in the CDC light trap that's hanging there, um, I, had, I set up eight of those on a weekly basis uh, overnight. And then they're picked up the next morning, and we freeze the mosquitoes, and then separate them from the uh, non-target species and identify every single one that we're capable of identifying underneath the microscope. And um, so prior to last year, uh, three years ago, we had 60, we trapped over 68,700 mosquitoes. <coughs> and, um, and this past year, I had 128,473 mosquitoes. Wow. Yeah. A lot of mosquitoes, and again, most of them were the trivitatus, the upland mosquito. Yeah. Sure. No, I no, I don't. I don't think I. I I'm currently, I don't think I'm making much of a difference. Uh, we're a very small district. Um, there's a lot of areas um, to reach. We are not positioned right now to be able to utilize our best management practices. Um, one of the challenges when I'm doing mapping and when I'm doing surveillance, I need to connect enough dots of mosquito larva activity in the Lemon Fair Valley and the Cornwall Swamp to put a thousand acre treatment together. Because that's what an aerial treatment requires. And the only air helicopter service that serves us currently is North Fork, Long Island. And so they actually have to ferry a helicopter across the Long Island Sound and then drive up here and they're not going to do that for less than 1,000 acres. Yeah. And I can't treat 1,000 acres with a backpack sprayer. Yeah. And, and I can't stamp out fires you know, where there's only three acres that light up here and five acres there and 15 acres there and maybe another 30 acres there. I'm still far from 1,000 acres. So I don't have the best management practices at my, at my disposal. Best management practices going forward, as identified on that one poster over there, drones. Drone technology has come so far that there's now a mechanical drone that has a 40-pound payload capacity, can treat up to 200 acres a day. I could stamp out a lot of fires if I had access to a drone. And, uh, but there's, currently, there's no one in New England that's operating one of those and hiring themselves out for, for that purpose. They're also used in agriculture. They can be used for a lot of different things that keep tractors off of fields, particularly when they're muddy. And they can, be, they can be applying seed, they can be applying fertilizer, they can be doing a lot of things with these mechanical drones that have this um, carrying capacity. So it's there. We're just, we're, again, we're a small district, and we're just not able to, to get there. But that's my goal. So the aerial spraying that we used to do is no longer? Yeah, the fixed-wing aircraft, um, <laughs> the aircraft itself just fell apart um, in the tar you know, at the airport, um, <laughs> and it was uh, it was it wasn't safe, and it was difficult. It was difficult to get a pilot. We had we had a lot of difficult times getting getting a pilot, and uh, and when the when the plane was being used, uh, I don't know how effectively um, surveillance was. Uh, basically, the valley was painted a lot, and uh, with uh, with BTI granules. And, um, but I don't know if the dots were necessarily connected and there, I think there could have been a lot of wasted product um, during those years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a lot more accountability for, for what, you know, what I'm expected to do. What about all those birds that depend on the mosquitoes? Mm -hmm. I think you're, you're taking care of. Yeah, um, for the most part, I would say if, by comparison to all the mosquitoes that are out there, we're probably not having much impact, especially early spring mm -hmm. again. And, uh, but it's, you know, the later season when people are wanting to get into their gardens, you know, come June, July, that's where we really want to be trying to stay on top of treatment scenarios when possible. Yes? How much water do you need to 
How much water movement do you need to? To disrupt this whole segment. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question. Like oh, or, or yeah. So typ yeah, typically you don't you don't find mosquitoes in currents. Okay, they're going to be in the eddies of currents, perhaps, but they're not going to be actually in a current itself. Um, so they're looking for still water. So like the floodplain is an ideal place where it's just really calm, um, you know, slow moving water at best. What about the shallow edges of ponds? Shallow edges of ponds could be um, a, a, an area where, um, and it, that, that's, that's an area that you could treat with a dunk and uh, would help, you know, probably eliminate mosquitoes there. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, um, I don't know of, I've not come across anything that I, I could recommend. Um, I've heard some people say that geraniums will help, you know, uh, keep mosquitoes. And there was, yeah, one person I knew had, her whole deck was in geraniums. We were sitting out there having a meal. Weren't bothered, but I don't know if it was the geraniums or uh, what circumstances were that. But, but it, yeah, let me know if you come across something. <laughs> yes? Interesting that you say that. They typically do. Yeah, the males come off. The males come off first. In fact, um, it was two weeks ago. Um, I was at my neighbor's house in the evening. Came back across, and the porch light, and I had four male mosquitoes flying at my front door. And uh, and I could obviously I could see their antenna with my naked eye, and, and but none of them were were female. So it was the first. I can always tell when when we're going to catch it because you see. Males on flowers a, a day or so. Oh, okay. Before yeah. the females show up. Yeah, yep. Huh. Interesting. Nice. You live just um, above the Lester Flats, um, you know, like the prime oh, yeah. place. Yes. They are. Exactly, so, yeah. And have been for 37 years, so we remember when they were just horrible those years with Madeline Kim. And <laughs> yes. And then Yeah. And so it's so frustrating now that you can't, they can't do it because, you know, because of these, I guess a lot of it's the thousand acre issue. It is, but that district also has the acreage. They, and I, I don't know that they have the staff to be doing the surveillance to connect the dots. It sounds like you are doing, I mean, it's a completely different district. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, Craig, I don't know whether you want to get into this or not, but given the mosquito situation right here, and given the fact that there are only two mosquito districts in the state, and given that there are mosquitoes throughout the state, pretty much, I think, last year, is the state um, thinking about reconfiguring mosquito management at the state level? Currently not. No, not at all. no, no, and it's it's a, it's a question we we keep pushing, and it's a question. And Heidi, thank you for actually bringing this up. This is a question where you as citizens need to be writing to our legislators, and because that's the only thing that's really going to make make mosquito a mosquito control program more effective in the state. Ideally, what I'd like to see happen is districts found formed by county where now you've got you know, a, somewhat of a county tax and revenue to support a program that could be much more effective in targeting uh, communities and, and habitats. And, um, but I mean, even here in Middlebury, um, you know, I've brought it to the original planning commission's attention. I said, you know, mosquitoes are coming out of the drainage, the drainage you know, uh, on the roads here in, in Middlebury, you know, and all these residents. And like, you know, get a, an onion bag, put a rock in there and a dunk, and throw it down into the into the drain, and that will help eliminate mosquitoes that are breeding. Because I've seen mosquito adults, mosquitoes flying out of those drains, and um, I don't know if, I don't know if they're if they're doing it. But I don't know who would do that in Middlebury. I don't know what uh, organization, but I brought it to the I brought it to their attention. Yeah, road workers could. Yeah, yeah. Again, 
but you know, writing, you know, write your, your town representatives, write your legislators, express your concern, express what you desire to see. Um, I think that's really the, the one leg going forward. Ellen. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, do you fear any problems with green stormwater pollutions and increased mosquitoes? Any so drain? Green stormwater. Oh, green stormwater? Yeah, any green stormwater structures that then cause more mosquito habitat? Yeah, yeah because they're, what they're basically ponds that are holding back water to allow the water to drain more naturally without flooding areas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I've been attending the Northeast Mosquito Control Association conferences for a good 10 years now, and, and that's one that's not come up, but I'll, I'll definitely, I'll, I've got some friends down in Massachusetts, I'll write to them about that and see if that's a, and I can get back to you on an answer. Yeah. Good questions. The retention ponds. The retention ponds, yeah. Well, yeah. retention ponds are, are less of, there's a lot more innovative things that they're trying to do now, which they're not supposed to hold more. Yeah, I can almost picture them. It's almost like a, a ditch, and then there's little dams down the length of the ditch. Is that an example of one? Okay, the different designs. Yeah, yeah. Well, I thank you, and I'll take questions on one on one. But I'd like for you to get up and look around, um, look at the mosquitoes under the microscope. Um, Go ahead and touch Uncle, Uncle Tom's microscope over, over there <laughs> and say, I've actually touched that microscope. And you can actually Google that commercial. You can get that commercial up and, and look at it again. And uh, so, but thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.